Hello Year 12 and welcome to your first uh, video here on Tudors. I'm going to be talking you through your remote learning task 6 which is on the Henrician economy. You uh, have your tasks at the end of your PowerPoint uh, to do once you have gone through uh, these slides. You can uh, either read through them yourself or listen along with me or it is up to you. Importantly though, you need to be making sure that throughout you are keeping notes in some form, bullet points, a mind map, whatever works best for you. Now, just before we begin, I would like you to do a recap uh, on the economy of Henry VII because I think he provides a really interesting contrast to the economy under Henry VIII. You know, look into your notes on what trade was like, what exploration was like, what farming was like, and then consider how prosperous or how much of a depression was Henry VII's economy in during his reign. You'll remember names like John Cabot, perhaps. Also to help you, I've attached a YouTube video which also runs through Henry VII's economy to uh, supplement your notes. So without further ado, let's move on to today's lesson question, which will be, how could we characterise the economy under Henry VIII circa 1536 to 47? We're going to be focusing on the latter half of Henry's reign, we're going to be touching in the 1520s a little bit, but mainly talking about the latter years of his reign. To split it up, we are going to first of all look at some general context. We are going to then consider foreign policy, industry and trade, and agriculture, and the role of Cromwell, and how all of these came together to impact the economy, and then looking at the rise of poverty and depression under Henry VIII as well. And then, as I said, your three tasks are positioned at the end of the PowerPoint. So, for some general context, one big thing that has happened during the reign of Henry VIII is that the population has increased. The population has increased quite substantially, which is on one hand a good thing, because it suggests that people are living longer, people are healthier, the mortality rate has dropped. But the flip side of that is that unfortunately, because there is so many people around, there is a lot of labour around, there's a lot of manpower, so people are competing. And the fact there is so many people around in which to do jobs means that food is in short supply and that wages are low. So although this high population positive side, actually in terms of the economy, it starts to have a bit of a detrimental effect. And yet on the other hand of this, you do have this increase in real extreme wealth. You have many people who really benefit hugely from the economic boom under Henry. You have the rise of wealthy farmers and landowners. For example, the man William Stump, he becomes a very wealthy clothier. So he's a man who really prospers from the cloth trade, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But yes, you have this increase in extreme wealth, so much so that the likes of Mr Stump there, he was based in a place called Malmesbury, which is in Wiltshire, which is kind of, kind of in the west, southwest of the country. He was able to convert the ruins of an old abbey into his own house. He was that rich. And I think a way of really summing up just how rich and how poor, you know, the kind of disparity that developed within society is this idea that the richer became richer and the poor poorer. Society became really stratified and really divided and there was a really big gap now between the rich and the poor. And it kind of began this mentality that the poor were kind of poor for their own fault. They were idle, they were lazy. This kind of mentality started to emerge during this time. So that's the kind of context of the economy and kind of thus going forward, how does Henry VIII respond to it? So foreign policy, we know, is a big part of Henry's reign, and Henry's always aiming for glory, and Henry's always aiming to get back at the French, the Scots, or the Habsburgs. And in the latter half of his reign, yes, he is at it again. He is getting concerned again about the border with Scotland, so much so that, yes, he has to go to war with them again, and yes, he successfully defeats them in 1542. What really triggers this concern with Scotland is that James V has just married Mary of Guise, who is a relative of the French king, and Henry was really worried that the French and the Scots would get into cahoots and start plotting against him. So he had to deal with this threat. And yes, he is successful. He does defeat them, and James V dies, actually not from battle but from a fever. But the point is, Scotland is actually taken down a notch, and the French and the Scots do not get into uh, major cahoots. But, of course, the financial cost of this is extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. And this is where the economy comes in, because Henry you know, demands a lot from Parliament. He's continually asking for subsidies. 
He is also selling off a lot of his newly gained monastic land to fund this war. <laughs> yes, it's perhaps it's successful diplomatically, but as always, Henry leaves his successors really debt ridden, very debt ridden, and it's so different to how we know Henry the Seventh left, left Henry the Eighth. Henry the Seventh left England in a really financially secure state, and Henry just did not, and a lot of that was due to his foreign policy. A little side note: uh, James V here and Mary of Guise are the mother and father of Mary Queen of Scots, very important woman who we will come to when we look at Elizabeth. Following the war with Scotland, Henry then decides to team up with Charles and the Habsburgs because he wants to increase his kind of opposition towards the French and again he is successful. Henry and Charles march on Calais and although Henry at this point has become so obese and so fat that he now has to be winched onto his horse, as in he actually has to be picked up and put on his horse, he is successful and he manages to fortify and take the big sort of big town of uh, Bologna or Boulogne. So again, big victory, but then Francis the king starts demanding that he wants to invade back, but actually he doesn't for all kinds of reasons. And um, so it's agreed that France and England will try and make some kind of peace treaty. And they basically agree to stop going to war with each other in 1546 with the Treaty of Ard, just imagine it hard without the H. And it was agreed that England would keep uh, Boulogne and receive £200,000 a year from the French. So it's pretty successful, you know, and Henry's about to die a year later. So <laughs> he goes out with a little bang, I suppose. But yes, he manages to gain money from France as well as diplomatic victories. But as I just said to you, how on earth was Henry able to fund this war with France when he just struggled to fund his war with Scotland? Well, he does something called debasement. Now, this war with France cost two million pounds, an extraordinary amount of money in this day and age, let alone then. So in, in order to fund this war, Henry does something called debasement, which basically means you devalue the currency. He had the silver in his coins removed, or not all of it, but parts of the silver in his coins were removed and replaced with base metal. This obviously meant that it, coins were cheaper to make and thus they were more in circulation. So yes, initially, in the early years of the debasement, it was very successful because there is more money around. So therefore, Henry was able to fund his wars. However, as we know in the long run, the more money you make, the more its value decreases. And there was real concern amongst merchants and shopkeepers about this, and so it encouraged them to put up their prices because it leads to inflation. Now, with inflation, prices rise and the value of money drops. So again, this is gonna have a really detrimental effect on the economy. And those who really suffer are the, are the poor, who find themselves not being able to afford basic items because of how high prices have become. So debasement has a really detrimental effect on the economy in the long term, although Henry is able to use it initially to fund his wars. Industry and trade, another really key factor in uh, Henry's economy at this time. Now, the cloth trade is exceptionally important under the reign of Henry VIII. It is just booming, 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 and it becomes perhaps the most important aspect of industry at this time because it is passing through London at a really quick rate. About 70% of all cloth exports are happening in England. They're happening through England's English merchants' hands, which is absolutely, um, absolutely brilliant for Henry's economy and increases prosperity hugely. Even more so because a little village in Suffolk whoop whoop, gets its name given to a new cheaper lighter cloth called Kersey, which also is a really popular uh, cloth in this time. So crucially, although there is a decline in raw wool, there is an increase in woolen cloth and this is a real big uh, contributor to the prosperity of Henry's economy. And here's to show you a lovely map of the trade routes. Now, key export line was between London and Antwerp. And that's why what I mentioned to you about how a lot of the trade passed through London. So London became the real centre of this wealth. Sort of the more regional, provincial ports like Boston, Bristol, they suffered. They did not have such a direct line to the cloth trade. So they were not prospering as much as London, but overall, England was doing very, very well. And importantly, three other regions of England, namely Yorkshire, East Anglia, and the West Country, they became centres of dyeing because while cloth was being dyed, they became the centres of sort of the industry for dyeing. So they really prospered too, especially South Suffolk, actually. So big up us because they really developed in this time. It is also important to mention 
that although, as I said, 70% of the cloth trade was being exported and being passed through England, foreign powers were also benefiting hugely too. Places like Antwerp, places like Venice were really successful in trade. So England was not alone in this by any means. Now moving on to exploration. Now Henry VIII could not be more different from his father in regards to exploration and did not pursue an interest in this area at all. He did not develop or encourage it. There were no major discoveries, no really major, not many major merchants at this time. Yes, you had Sebastian Cabot around, the son of John, but he spent most of Henry's reign in Spain. He was aware that his monarch was not interested in what he was doing and he only really returns when Edward's on the throne. So yes, you also have a man called Robert Thorne who's also doing a little bit of exploration around Iceland and Newfoundland, uh, looking at kind of where they can get fish. But really, exploration is just not a, not a big factor in the reign of Henry VIII at all. It is not a major contributor to the economy, and it's something that Henry VIII just was not remotely interested in. Now moving on to agriculture. So agriculture has two important aspects to it, engrossing and enclosures. Now you've looked at enclosures before under the reign of Henry VII. They were mainly a problem for him, not for Henry VIII. A lot of the issues there and in terms of the illegal enclosures that were set up were dealt with by Henry VII or in the early years of Henry VIII's reign. Wolsey and Thomas More both had a problem with, in with enclosures. They saw it was harmful to rural communities and harmful to their way of life, so they tried to put a stop to it with limited success because it did continue to grow a little bit in uh, certain locations, namely the East Midlands, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire area. But it was really on the whole a regional problem, not a national problem. And we'll mention a little bit more to do with that when we go on to Cromwell in a moment. But the big problem that emerged for Henry, well, problem, but also, I suppose, benefit, was engrossing. Now, engrossing was something that developed at this point where farms would merge together. So two or more farms would merge and share their land and work together to produce more crops. Because, of course, yeah, the more people working on the land, the more the more manpower, the more food. So it was a very successful policy initially for agriculture because yes, it increased produce, therefore it increased incomes. However, there were also issues regarding harvests and poor harvests happening during Henry VIII's reign, which we'll go on to in a moment, which had a disastrous effect because now it was rendering more families homeless because of course, it's now not just one family that's suffering, it's multiple families because they're all dependent on the same bit of land. So engrossing and enclosures continued to have an impact on the economy. Finally, Cromwell, he has, he does have a small role to play in, in the economy at this point in regards to enclosures. He brings in this act against enclosure which aimed to kind of limit enclosures and limit the number of sheep people could have <laughs> to 2,400. Because, because of course we've got to remember that enclosures uh, are centred on this idea of converting crops into pastoral land, so crops, arable farming into pastoral farming, which is having sheep or cows. So Cromwell tried to limit that, tried to limit the number of sheep people could have, but the success was limited. And Cromwell really is preoccupied with many other things. He's preoccupied with dealing with issues of the church, dealing with the dissolution of the monasteries, dealing with the marriage to Anne of Cleves. And he's dead by 1540, so he is not not a central part of the economy at this time. He really is not long for this world, but his act against enclosure was worth mentioning. Now, finally, we need to talk about the fact that, yes, there was many factors that contributed to an extreme poverty and depression in the reign of Henry VIII. You had two bad harvests, which led to a rise in food prices, and thus led to the limited success of engrossing. Wages just did not take off at this point at all. There was no real increase in wages, and that links to the fact that there was an increase in population. And finally, there was a rise in poverty overall due to debasement, due to high prices of food and lower wages. So really, many people, especially lower earners, really suffered, really suffered uh, during the reign of Henry VIII. So to conclude, I have got you three tasks here to do. Number one is to consider again the factors that contributed to lower standards of living. So which of these do you think really had a harmful effect on the economy and thus uh, lowered standards of living? 
pick one of these and argue which one is the most important factor or if there's another one you want to argue instead. Then I would like you to have a look at this quote by John Guy. England was economically healthier, more expansive and more optimistic under the Tudors at any time since the Roman occupation. Now I know he's talking about the whole Tudor dynasty so I want you to think about this quote just in relation to Henry VII and Henry VIII. Think about under those two kings was England economically healthier more expansive and more optimistic. Was it any of those things at all or, or not? And I'd like you to respond to that quote, please, and consider whether it is an accurate descriptor. And finally, using your sort of work from task two, can you ultimately characterise the economy under Henry VIII? Can you describe it? Can you explain it? What words would you use? Okay. How would you characterise the economy? How would you describe it? And that is the end of the tasks. So, Make sure that your notes are completed on this PowerPoint and we look forward to discussing it more with you in our lesson on Wednesday.